we have Tony May, who is going to be teaching you Python. So over to Tony. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Tony May. I'm a researcher in the School of Chemistry at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I'm a computational chemist and I've been programming for, for about 15 years now. Uh, and I'm going to give you a sort of short introduction to how to use Python. Um, so I'm going to start out with a couple of slides just um, to get everyone sort of arriving after lunch and digesting. So it's a bit easier um, to see what's happening. Uh, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen, hopefully. Uh, 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 always the classic. Um, okay. So if you can see my screen, can you please use your green stickers just to, as a wake up exercise again? Okay, fantastic. Um, all right, so this morning we spent um, a lot of time interacting with the computer through a terminal and you kind of uh, learned a little bit about um, Bash, essentially, which is a scripting language that lets you interact with your computer in a non sort of pointy clicky way. So, but what about programming or coding in Python? What, what are these terminologies? Just sort of to get you started with that. Um, I'm probably gonna see if that works. Can everyone still see my screen? Yep. Cool. Okay, excellent. Yep. So programming is really the process of writing programs, i.e. a series of instructions a computer can understand and can execute and hopefully produce some useful output. Uh, and it really is a multiple step process. So um, first of all, we need to kind of identify the problem that can be solved computationally. Then uh, you need to identify a computational solution. And then you go ahead and implement that solution in a specific language. And then you need to sort of test, validate, and adjust the implementation. So all of that is really what is programming. The coding part of it is really just the implementing step three in a specific language. And the specific language we're looking at today is Python. So Python is quite interesting because uh, it's the name of the language but also uh, the name of the um, interpreter and kind of acts as a, a way of, of uh, running your, your program or script. So at the top here, I've written a very simple example of a print statement to screen. So this can be saved in a file that is called hello dot py and py ending means that we're writing a Python file and then if you go back to sort of something what you've done in your uh, terminal this morning and type python hello.py, it will print whatever you put in your print statement. Um, so I can do this um, as well. I need to do another share because So I have now my, my uh, terminal here. I can open this file, hello.py, uh, which doesn't exist, but I can write into it, say print hello um, NBC. Carpentries trees uh, work shop and if I save this uh, and now type python hello.py uh, it will print that 
to my screen and say hello to everyone. So this is one way of writing a Python script. And what we've just done, or I've just done here, is write a file called hello.py, which I then call with my Python interpreter that will then run what the instructions are written in the programming language Python. Um, so I'm going to go back to, I've not found a good way of switching between these shares, so apologies for that. Um, so if we go back to um, this, this is kind of exactly what I've done. Um, so generally, before we actually get started with a bit more Python writing, there are some general good practices. And I think I'm going to mention them now, even though we're probably not going to write anything super complex today. But bear that in mind as you progress with writing um, Python codes, Python scripts to do data analysis or something. Um, make sure you plan before you write. Make sure you comment your code, and I will show you what that means um, throughout the, this afternoon session and in the morning. Um, make sure you'll be, be aware of sort of hidden characters. And again, in one second, I'll show you how uh, to do that. Use version control, which is what you're going to learn about um, tomorrow afternoon. Um, go and talk to people who know how to program. They'll be happy to give you feedback and experience. And um, Programming takes practice. You're not going to be able to just know everything at once. And then it's really all about Googling. Um, many people would have had similar issues if you try and solve something program programmatically and you get stuck. Um, Stack Overflow is a great place to look for. And I think the more you practice your programming, the more you get used to kind of understanding what the language is and what the solutions mean. And by copying, pasting, and changing things that already exist, uh, it'll be a lot easier. So I'm just going to go uh, two comments about hidden uh, characters, because that is probably something you're not aware of if you're more a sort of word user. So here's, here's an example of a, a script that is a very bad example of a script because it's got spelling errors. It's not really clear what is happening at all. And um, first of all, what we'll learn also today is kind of Python um, relies on indentation. So usually you, you use four empty spaces. And what you see here is this line is actually a hidden tab character. So if you hit, hit your tab key, that was ha what happens um, sort of under the hood. And the, the four dots are, are actual characters, um, uh, are actual space characters, which you wouldn't normally see. But if you use a um, text editor such as Atom or PyCharm or Sublime, you can make them visible. And um, if you don't use Jupyter as a programming environment, um, and you want to use a text editor to write complex scripts, you can't use Word, you will have to use something else. And I would highly recommend any of these three text editors. Um, you will have encountered Nano potentially um, today. Good news is this is more just a sort of word of warning from me. This is not something we'll be using um, over the next uh, two sessions. So we're actually going to use an environment called Jupyter Lab. Um, but you may well want to program in a different way at some point. So this is kind of me a be aware of this exists as well. Um, yeah, so what are sort of a typical ways of writing um, programs? So you can do it interactively. You can actually just, rather than doing the sort of Python hello.py executing a script, you can actually just start um, the interpreter immediately and start interacting with it. But obviously, writing very complex workflows, it's not going to be very easy. Um, so so slightly easier one is um, using a text editor where you write your, your script and then um, uh, execute that. Um, you can use something like a scientific Python environment that exists you may have heard of or may have not heard of. It's called Spider, 
or you can use something called Jupyter Lab, and that is what we will be using uh, today. Um, so hopefully everyone of you has managed to install this. I'm going to show you how to start the environment now um, by going back to sharing this bit of the screen. So if I just type in my uh, terminal, um, I'm going to clear this. Uh, if I type Jupyter Lab, essentially a browser window will pop up and I will uh, share that with you now. Okay, I'm not in. Yeah. One moment, sorry. Um, I'm having some issues with my screens. Uh, okay, so you should have had something like this pop up. Uh, can you just indicate with your green stickers whether you get to the point where you have uh, Jupyter Lab pop up? Yours probably will look slightly different. You probably won't have a Julia thing there. You might have other bits not there. But as long as you have a notebook heading and a Python 3 option, you're in the right spot. We have a couple of red stickies. So, um, yeah, I probably will wait for everyone to actually get to this point uh, because otherwise we're, we're going to be <laughs> too lost. So a question from Susanna in the chat. Yes, uh, this is um, an Anaconda Python that comes with Jupyter Lab, which is a tool. Yeah, so, so another way you can do this is by searching for, I think, Anaconda Launcher or something. If you're on Windows and you've installed it, you should be able to double click on it. Um, unfortunately, I'm on a Mac, so I can't show you. <laughs> Uh, so what you search for if you search for Anaconda on your machines. Yes, it will launch a new web browser. Uh, if you are in your terminal and if you type Jupyter Lab. Uh, okay, so Susanna, you are okay. Can you turn your red sticky into a green sticky? And then we have uh, Matthias as well. Matthias, what uh, seems to be your problem? Ah, okay, I'm trying from Anaconda Launcher, but when I try to launch it, search, launch it, but it just stops. Um, can you unmute yourself and, and tell us what you've done exactly? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So I see Jupyter Lab in my Anaconda Navigator. I mm -hmm. click on Launch. It triggers something. And it then just stops. So the Jupyter notebook worked, uh, Spider is working. Uh, I don't well, know what- If your Jupyter notebook works, then that's fine. I think I eventually I want everyone to get to okay. the notebook part and hit the- Okay, because I, I never used the, the Jupyter lab, so I don't know if it worked in the past. That That is fine. As long as you can get to a Jupyter notebook, um, we're okay. So can you see that in your browser, uh, something similar to to? Can you uh, have like a? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my Jupyter notebook is working, uh, okay. uh, so it opened, and I'm just going to create one. Thank you. Okay. So Jupyter okay. notebook is well, Jupyter Lab is a more advanced version of notebook where you can actually run other programs underneath, not just Jup uh, not just Python. But if you have a, a Jupyter notebook, that's good enough. That's, that's good enough. That's all we'll be using today. Yeah. So. Um, 
So there's okay. two, so Matthias is fine. So we have one other problem. So Simone can't um, open. Can you unmute yourself um, and tell us <coughs> what the problem is? Yes, yeah, so I'm trying to open Jupyter Notebook from Anaconda Navigator. I click launch, but nothing happens. So if you if you just type Anaconda on your machine, is that a Windows Windows machine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What do you get when you search for Anaconda? Uh, Jupyter. Okay. Not book Anaconda free. So if, can you can you start try with notebook? Click on notebook. Yeah, okay. I click that. Now I have to access the notebook, open this part in a browser. Okay. So I have to copy and paste. Wait. Maybe I can share one my screen. Yeah, yeah. I'll make you a co-host. Uh, please share your screen. So Oh, no, only the host can share this. this no, okay. I'll make you a co-host. I'm on it. There you go. I think this is similar to what we had with Mat Matthias just now. Oh, okay. So basically, can no you problem. see my screen? So I got this. Can you see it? Yeah. So basically, I have to copy this one. Um, I think you, you already have something running. So you, you've got some. No, if you just go to your browser and type local uh, host um, or local host colon 8888. Okay. Okay, we'll try now. So it looks like something is already running on that port. So I think it's the other tab, maybe the second mm -hmm. tab. Yeah, there you go. Okay. That's already running. Perfect. Okay. So do you okay. see oh. now you see on your right there's a new bit uh, top right in your top right okay yeah that bit new. lower yeah new if you click on that and python 3 oh there, okay that's what you need sorry <laughs> i will stop sharing thank no, you very much no okay. it's okay so um <laughs> let's make sure on the same page to get you going so look, looks like that's everyone. If not, please make sure you shout now. Yeah, now would be your chance to tell us that you're not ready to carry on. Looks like everyone is, excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. Um, so everyone should be at a point where you have the cell with a blinking cursor, essentially. Um, and so in, in Jupyter Lab, you have a bunch of other features. I'm probably not going to talk you through. Um, have a play around with them if you're interested, but we're going to focus on how to interact uh, with the notebook, really. Um, so what you can do is um, you can create a new notebook by uh, going with a file thing and you can set, you can select a kernel. I mean, I have a bunch of kernels available, but Python 3 is what we want. Um, if you want to give your notebook a name, uh, I can right click on it and then say rename notebook to um, Python part one. Um, here's a very good hint. If you're not used to um, programming, don't put spaces in your file names, use underscores instead. Uh, it'll make it a lot easier to interact with uh, large file structures programmatically. Um, so I now have these two notebooks open. Um, I can um, actually uh, export these notebooks as many different things. So I can export them as a PDF. I can export them as HTML. I can export them as, a, as an executable script. So that would be this .py file um, I've kind of shown you before. But obviously, at the moment, we don't have anything in this notebook. Um, 
So another thing you should know about in um, Jupyter in yeah Jupyter notebooks is that you have a um, command mode um, and an editing mode. So if you hit escape, um, you can see that the 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 frame is not blue anymore. Huh? Oh no! I stopped sharing my screen. Did I? No. What happened? No, no. You're still it's sharing, still but sharing. it just yeah, it's a slightly different ratio of your. Ah, okay, sorry. Screen. I just lost. Proportions are different. No, no, it's back to to what it was. Really? Kind of. So now we can see. Uh, the, yeah, we can now see the website. Yeah, this is uh, kind of I'm gonna reshare. Sorry about this. Okay. Okay, so at the moment I'm in edit mode, um, which means I have this blue um, uh, blue line around it. So um, I can type something uh, that can be either code. So I can type print, hello. If I hit enter, you'll see that I get a new line. So if I want to execute the code, I need to hit shift enter. Um, I can also write down markdown. Um, so I can change the type of cell, which I do up here. So I can select either code or markdown or raw. Um, and markdown lets me basically annotate the notebook. So I can give it a heading and say, this is a markdown heading. And again, if I hit shift enter, it will execute it. If I now use the uh, escape button, I can, I can do, I can use commands um, and say, if I hit A, I will add um, a cell above. Um, if I hit X, I can delete the current cell. Um, if I hit Z, I can undo the last operation. Um, and B will create another cell below. Um, so these are sort of quick and easy ways to interact with your notebook. Um, I can also do these things, I can look at where they come from by um, looking at the sort of edit options here. I can also just click the buttons in, in my edit toolbar um, and that will do the same thing. But if you don't want to interact with your mouse, uh, you can do these things by, um, uh, by using the keyboard shortcuts and the keyboard shortcuts are given here with Z, X, C, V. So if you're unsure, you can just look it up in the, in the edit tab, essentially. So um, yeah, um, in terms of markdown, um, what you can do is more than just headings. So you can use um, bullet lists. Uh, so uh, no, again, make sure that I'm in a markdown cell. I can say um, this is item one. This is item two. Um, so I can now have lists. I can have different level headings. So um, again, if I'm in markdown, you can see how uh, the color changes. So it goes to this bright blue. And um, this is the biggest heading is a single um, hash key. And then if you want to go to smaller head headings, you just add number of hashes and then 
it makes them smaller. This is a level four heading. Um, what you will also um, see that depending on uh, how, whether you're in a code cell or in a markdown cell, uh, maths will be executed differently. Um, and yeah, generally the behavior of, of the notebook is quite different. So I would encourage you now to go to um, the exercises in, uh, in the first um, part of running and quitting Python. Um, at the bottom of that page, you have um, creating lists in Markdown. Uh, actually, I will just copy and paste. Um, so in the chat, so basically we've just kind of gone through through this uh, first page and at the bottom you have uh, an exercise about creating lists in Markdown, um, Matt and um, changing an existing cell from code to Markdown um, and um, equations. Um, and I would yeah encourage you to play around with that for a little bit now. How many minutes, uh, Tony, do you reckon? Let's go with um, I don't know, five minutes. Do you want to set the timer? Yeah, I'll, I'll um, see how you guys are doing in five minutes. And if you want more time desperately, we can do that. But I think maybe I would like to move on to the actual coding part, uh, because at the moment it's just um, interacting with the Jupyter Notebook. And feel free to ask questions while you're um, doing it. Either in the chat or also with the microphone. I think just um, just to be just a reminder, if you want to execute a, shell, a cell, uh, you need to hit shift return uh, to do so. So just hitting enter is not enough. Uh, and you will be using a lot of shift return. Or if you don't want to hit shift return, you can also use the play button up here that will have the same effect and it will uh, execute the code cell or the markdown cell and interpret it in either way. Also, if you think you're done with the exercise and don't have any questions, just hit again your green yes sticker. So that gives me also an indication of how you're getting on.
Okay, those of you who aren't finished, are you um, getting on okay or do you have any questions? Okay, so I'm gonna, if you haven't finished, don't worry, but uh, try and kind of listen to uh, what I say now and try and go back to um, the exercises later. Um, there are two things that are handy to know is a saving your notebook and closing it um, and restarting it is by using the open oh, sorry um uh, yeah you can use the, the file tab and you can see i have a lot of things i probably should have done this in a different directory hopefully but you can see these two green icons that tell me that this um notebook is running um, if I right click, I can do something like shut down the kernel uh, and I can do the same thing here, shut down the kernel. Now they are no longer running and I can no longer interact with them. I'm going to restart this one um, and I can do this by simply double clicking and then um, the kernel uh, symbol will be green again. That tells me that it's running. Um, sometimes once you have a little bit more um, uh, things going on, you might have to actually restart your notebook. Uh, and you can do that by using um, restart the kernel button. So you don't actually need to shut everything down and restart it. That will basically just restart the kernel and you have all your data you have in your notebook, but you're basically starting from a clean slate. There's nothing in memory and you'll understand hopefully in the next um, hour or so why this might be useful. All right, so let's um, actually get to some um, Python. So um, we'll start with some a concept called, actually I will close this and I'll start with a clean notebook. Come on. Why are you not? Okay. All right, I'm going to start a new notebook. I'm going to rename it. Um, session one. Um, and I'm going to add a heading to it. Um, because we're going to start with variables and I'm going to make that a markdown and execute this. So variables are names for values in Python uh, and you use the equal sign uh, to assign them. Uh, so I can say something like age equals 42. That means the variable name is age um, and I'm assigning a value of 42 to it on the left, uh, on the right. Um, so if I now add a second line to it, so I've not executed this at all yet, I can say first name equals Tony. And if I uh, now hit shift enter, um, these two variables are assigned. Variable names can only contain letters and digits and underscores. Uh, they cannot start with a digit and are case sensitive. So um, if I now query age, I can type in my next cell age and press shift enter and it returns me what we've assigned up here. If I were to say age, 
it will throw me an error and say the name age is not defined because I've misspelled it because I used a capital A rather than a, um, a lowercase a. Um, so yes, these are age sensitive. Um, in Jupyter Notebooks, it's quite nice because you can literally just type the variable name. Oops, sorry, I was not meant to do that. The variable name um, and shift enter, and then it gives you the output. In an actual Python program you want to run or write, um, that won't happen. Um, so you need to, in order to query the content of a, a variable, you need to use the print function and this um, so-called inbuilt function uh, print uh, that lets you print um, things to the screen. Um, so I'm going to edit the cell and use the print function uh, print. Um, in order to use it, I need to have this open bracket and a close bracket. Um, and you can you notice how this turned green, which means that it's um, it's a special function essentially, and it's built in and it's a print um, that lets you print things. So if I now execute that, you have exactly the same output as if you just put age. So let's make this a bit more um, interesting and actually print something a bit more meaningful. So we can say first name um, is age mm, years old. So now if I execute this cell again by hitting shift return, um, it says Tony is 42 years old. Um, print, you can see, automatically puts a single space between all the different arguments you put into print. Um, and it also wraps a new line at the end of this. So if we go back to the, when I told you about hidden characters, uh, what you can't see actually are these space characters and a new line character at the end of this line um, that are hidden from our view, essentially. Mm. Variables must be created before they're used. So if I say something like print oops, last, last name, um, it tells me that last name is not defined. Um, Python does try and use informative error messages. I think when you get started with Python, they might not seem very informative, but the more you use Python, um, the more understandable these error messages become. Um, <clears throat> so variables persist between cells. Um, I can, Again, if I look at first name here, that is still defined in the cell, even though I assigned it up here. Um, so now if we go back to this um, restart kernel uh, option, I've now restarted the kernel and I go straight in with this cell and hit shift enter it says, oh no, it's not defined because actually I cleared all the memory and I need to reassign this here at the start. Um, the kind of somewhat dangerous thing with Jupyter Notebook sometimes is that you can jump about in terms of where you execute things. Um, <laughs> but um, and, and that might mean that you have defined something in a non um, flow through way. So you can, you can be, um, this, can, this can cause problems essentially. So make sure that um, you don't jump about in terms of where you execute yourselves. And usually you want to build your Jupyter notebook in such a way that you start from the top and then you can run all the cells in order uh, because if you have to run them out of order, um, things become a bit messy, essentially. 
Uh, so let's uh, execute these things again. So age is still not defined, but now first name is defined again. <clears throat> uh, what you can also do is look at um, indices of characters uh, in Python. Uh, so Tony using these quotation marks is something called a string. Um, so I can define another string um, and I can call it at a name. Let's call it helium. Um, and now I can query what is the first letter um, in atom name. And I do this by typing print atom name. And I use open and close square brackets zero. So this is maybe a little bit confusing. You would think that the first letter should be one. But in fact, Python uh, starts counting from zero. Uh, so if you want the first uh, letter, it's zero. If you want, and not one, because if I change this to one, it will in, in fact print uh, the E from helium. Um, what you can also do is um, access um, substrings. So here you have this whole string, uh, helium. Let's um, look at um, another atom name. So I can reassign atom name. Um, sodium. So if I now print atom name, it is no longer helium. I've basically overwritten the same variable with a new assignment uh, called sodium. But I can look at um, maybe just the first three characters of a string. Um, and I can do that by saying atom name zero colon three. So in my accessing this character list, which is like a string is effectively a list of characters. Um, I can use this so-called slice notation uh, where I have the beginning and, and the end or the start and the stop, uh, which is in place of the index of the first element we want at the start. Um, and the end is the index of the just after the last element we want. Um, and that gives me a slice and um, start, uh, stop minus start gives you the length of the slice. So in this case, we can now just print the first three characters, um, sod. The other thing uh, you have is another inbuilt function uh, that lets you query information about the length. Um, of a string. So um, I can say print len of atom name, um, where len, because it kind of gets highlighted in green again, it tells me, oh, it's a special uh, function. It's an inbuilt function, and it will tell me the length of um, my string atom name. Um, what is quite useful is to um, use meaningful variable names. Let's assume I have lump equals 77 and bd gar equals um, Eliza. Uh, and if I now print um, BD car is plump is old, the output I get still makes sense. Eliza is 77 years old. Um, but reading this, I have no idea what B gar and flump might be. Um, so it's 
A, useful for yourself because future self in two weeks time might be very confused as to what you wrote. Um, or if you are working with people, if you wanna share your code, um, again, another person will have no idea what you meant with some of your variable names. Um, uh, so give them useful names. The other thing you can do is um, comment. Uh, you do that, you can do a line comment by using a hash behind um, a variable name. So I could say plum is actually the age of a person, um, but obviously it would make far more sense to just call the variable age rather than plum. And if I now execute this, um, whatever comes after the hash gets ignored. Um, it's just a comment that is useful for someone else to read or for yourself to read as a reminder. Um, yeah, and that kind of um, gets us on to some exercises uh, around variables. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of uh, exercises around swapping values, predicting values, challenge, um, uh, yeah. And I would encourage you to um, try and have a go at them. I'm probably gonna cut you off before you finish all of them just so we can move on through the material fast enough, but all the solutions are there so you can go back and look at these in your own time later on. Um, but yeah, so try and do that until um, 35 past or 25 to uh, three. Yeah, so if you choose I, if you choose a very long variable name that is very descriptive, um, you can use the autocomplete function. Um, so I can say um, uh, weather forecast in 1900 or something um, is bad, um, rather than having to type this long string, I can just hit, I can, I can start typing it and then hit tab and it will autocomplete the variable name. Um, and we'll, we'll probably handle a bit more about uh, autocomplete um, a little bit later anyway. Again, if you have any questions, um, feel free to use your microphone or type in the chat while you try and answer these questions. Um, Anissa, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Um, what do you mean by report writing like LaTeX? So like in LaTeX you can code kind of, well, not as good as Python, but then you can generate a report at the end of it. I was just wondering if Python does the same or is it just to generate data? 
Well, it's to generate and analyze data. So, I mean, you use Python for plotting, for example. Yeah. And we'll be doing that um, in a bit. And notebooks are quite good. So I tend to use notebooks as a, like in a lab diary fashion for analyses. So I would read in data at the start and then, and that would be my raw data. And then I'll do a bunch of manipulations to it and have different headings of what I do with all the data. And then essentially I have a notebook that I can then export as a LaTeX file or HTML file or something or PDF even that then just, um, contains my entire data analysis in one place uh, with plots with all the, I don't know, uh, mathematical manipulations I might have done. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you're after, but that's, yeah, what I, <laughs> I use it for. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Can I have a question about one of the exercises? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so one of the exercises, it says that um, you have to assign A as to 123 and then like print the second digit. And then it says that the object is not uh, subscribable, subscriptable, sorry. And then you, uh, it suggests to use a STR um, function. So like, how does it differ when you use like numbers and like letters? Why do you have to use str when using numbers and like you don't have to use that when using letters so i am not going to answer this one now because we're about to start on data types um oh. essentially a here try around a little bit and you'll see how things fail um question and yeah essentially there are like, variables have different types and we're going to talk about what these different types are Okay, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. There was a question from Simone this in the chat, but I did not get the question right. Um, so what are you trying to do? Do you want to duplicate the cell? Just or just copy it, copy and paste the text from the above cell or insert a new cell, a new empty cell? Yeah, no, just to copy quickly what is written, the cell that is above the one that I'm currently working on. So that, that's select and then copy and paste. Oh, okay. I thought that it was like in uh, Git bash that you just click the narrow on and you get the uh -huh. same. Okay. You, oh, you get the same. If you right yeah. click, you can do yeah. copy cell uh, and then control. Okay, well, maybe that doesn't work. Okay, never mind. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, there are some options from the from the menu, so you can yeah, paste down below. You can you can if you just highlight text in a cell, whether it's Python or um, or Markdown. Oh, okay. Perfect. Copy paste with the standard keyboard shortcuts. So Control C and Control V or Command C and Command V, depending on what um, operating system you're on. All right, I am aware that you probably haven't finished yet, but I will um, move on so we can get through a sufficient amount of material um, uh, today. So essentially, um, yeah, some of the exercises already kind of hint at the next topic, but just a sort of very quick recap of, of this one. Um, so variables store values. Um, you can use the print statement, which is an inbuilt function to display the values of a variable. Um, in a Jupyter notebook, these variables persist between cells. Um, you must create a variable before you can actually use the content of it. Um, you can use variables in calculations. Um, indexing in Python starts from zero um, and you can use indices and slices to access substrings um, if your variable is a string. Um, you have a encountered a second built-in function, which is the length function that gives you the length of a string. Um, Python is case sensitive and be sort of watchful of how you call your variables. So yeah, the next um, bit is all about data types and type conversions. So I'm gonna for this, uh, create a new heading. To a markdown, and I'm going to add a bunch of cells. So, um, yeah. So, <clears throat> every value in Python essentially has a specific type. Um, and you have three main types you have integers, which are positive or negative whole numbers. Um, such as, I don't know, five or minus 25. Then you have uh, floating point numbers, uh, which represent real numbers. So um, pi or two thirds or minus one fifth or something like this. And then you have string characters, um, usually called string. Um, and that is what the STR from the previous question comes from. So that's an indic um indicator. Um, so you can um, write strings either with single or double quotes. Um, so if we go back to name equals may, um, well, let's go last name. So my last name is may, I can either write it as this, or I can also write it as Um, may. What you can't do is mix and match single uh, or double quotes. And also, if you want to print a quotation mark within a string, then you should use double quotes and then single quotes in quotation mark. Otherwise, uh, things get a bit messy, but we'll see about that in a second. Um, so how do you know what type a particular variable is? Uh, or a particular number, uh, you can use again another built in function, uh, which is unsurprisingly called type. So we can, like, as before, where we used len uh, to look at the length of something, we can now say print type of 52. <coughs> and what it will return is. Uh, class int. And what we're really interested in is that input because that means it's an integer, which means it's a whole number. Um, another example would be um, print 
type um, of fitness. Okay, I have not defined fitness yet, so let's um, add a cell here and define that. Um, fitness um, equals average. So if I now execute this and look at the type, it tells me it's of type string, str. Um, don't worry about the class thing at the moment. That is something for later, um, much later. Um, so the type of a um, variable defines what can be performed. So if I have two integers, I can do max operation. So five minus three is two. Um, if I do hello minus H, it will give me an error. Uh, and it says unsu unsupported operand type for minus string and string. So um, basically that tells me I can't use the minus operator on string variables. However, I can use the plus and the multiplication operator. Uh, so let's have a look at what happens if we're adding character strings together. Um, so full name um, equals Adam plus space plus mm, uh, Welch. And if I now say print full name, um, you can see that all of the different characters or all of the different strings were added together. Um, I can also um, use a multiplication character, um, which allows us to multiply a, a printer. So let's say we wanted to print a separator or something. So in, in our output, um, I can say print, uh, no, I can define separator, separator um, equals, the equals character times 10. And if I now print separator, it um, prints this 10 times. So from before, we learned that strings will have length. So we have the atom name length. Uh, we can also now look at the full length of the, the variable full name. Um, so print then full name um, tells me that it's 10. Um, however, if I try and do the same thing with a number, oh, then 52, again, it says the object of type integer has no length. So yeah, the, the, the integer has no length, whereas the, the, the string does. Um, so what about adding numbers and strings? This was kind of what the exercise looked at. So what about if I say one plus two? So I'll give me an error. It says unsupported operand type for plus for integer and string because we're trying to add an integer type and a string type here. Um, so why is this not allowed? Well, it's not very clear what I'm asking the computer to do because is one one plus two, is that three? Because I should interpret the two as an integer 
Or should I interpret them as two strings and say, actually, this is one and two? Um, so because that is unclear, this is not supported. Um, but what we can do is cast um, the data type to something we want. So we can say um, print one plus using int as a, a casting function um, two, and that will do the integer operation of adding one plus two, or I can look at doing the string operation by saying string of one plus two uh, will give me the output one, two. However, what you can do is mix integers and floats uh, freely in operations. Um, so I can easily say print half is one over 2.0. So one is an integer number now and 2.0 is a floating number and the output is a floating number. Um, I can also look at squaring things. Um, three squared is 3.0 to the power of um, two. So now we use um, two multiplication signs to signify um, the power of. And again, I'm mixing a integer with a floating point and it does the expected operation um, as you would. Um, the next thing that is uh, important to remember is that variables only change value when something is assigned to them. Um, and this might be slightly different to if you're used to working with Excel, for example. Um, so let's have a look at the following snippet of code. First equals one. So I'm assigning the value one to first. And I'm saying second equals five times first. So at the moment, if we think about it logically, um, so I've assigned first, so one gets replaced in here. So second should become five. Um, I'm assigning, assigning five to the variable second in this line. And I'm saying first equals two. Um, so I'm now reassigning first. But that does not mean that second gets updated retrospectively. So if I look at the printout now, um, first is first, um, um, and second is second. Um, what you might expect from a sort of Excel point of view, that second is in fact 10, but it's not. Um, second is only assigned here and it doesn't matter that first gets reassigned later on. Um, yeah, and that kind of gets us to the bit of the exercises for um, data types. And I would give you guys 10 minutes to do that before we then go into our afternoon coffee slash tea break. And again, feel free to ask questions while you're working on these. Or anything that was unclear from data types um, just now. Does everyone have the link to the exercise page? Is everyone okay? And, um... So I just, um, yeah, so if you just scroll down to that page is where the exercises are. Can you um, drop the link in the chat as well, Tony? I just did that, yeah, yeah, that's what okay. I did. Okay, thank um, you.
and basically everything I just talked through, you'll find above the exercises as well.
Is everyone getting on okay? Cool, great. So I think the, the class part in the type output is essentially that um, something that happens behind the doors of Python um, and you don't need to worry about the class identifier at the moment. The important bits are the float, int and string part. All right, I'm gonna suggest that we now go into our break uh, and we'll reconvene at 3.30. I'm gonna be available five minutes early should you want to discuss any questions with regard to the last bit of exercises. Um, I do encourage you to actually take a break from your screen and not try and finish those exercises in the next half hour if you haven't um, done that yet. Um, walk about in a little bit move your shoulders, um, open a window or something like that. And um, yeah, I'll see you back at 3.30. And if you have any questions, I'll be here from 3.25. Thanks, Tony. I'll just show a slide. Thank you. I can also. Almost everybody.
Uh, do you want to start a bit again? Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, hopefully you all got on all right with the data types exercises. Um, just a sort of very quick um, recap. So every value or variable in Python has a type. In order to query what the type is, you can use the built-in function type. Um, types control essentially what you can do with a variable, um, whether you can add, multiply, divide, uh, or whether you can ac uh, access um, character strings. Um, strings have a length, but numbers don't. Um, in order to do certain operations, you must make sure that um, they are the same type. Um, so strings and integers and floats uh, need to be converted. However, integers and floats you can uh, work with free, freely without having to convert them. Um, and variables only change their value when something is assigned to them. Um, all right, so the next bit is all about uh, built-in functions and asking for help um, in Python. So we've already encountered some built-in functions. So I'm going to share my screen again. Um, and, um, Okay, so um, yeah, I'm just gonna create another heading in my notebook. Um, it's built in functions. And I'm gonna add a bunch of um, cells again. So, <clears throat> I think I very briefly um, mentioned comments before. So here is another good point to mention it again. So you can use com comments in different way. Um, this sentence gets uh, ignored by Python. Um, I can now say um, age equals five. Um, this is a variable that stores age, um, and that again, anything after the hash gets ignored, um, but it's quite easy for you to read what's going on. Um, so what are functions? Um, you will um, yes, there is a way to comment and uncomment multiple lines of code. Um, what you can do is use a doc string. Um, you would use triple quotation marks in a doc string, for example. Um, we may cover this when we move on to writing your own functions, but right now I'm just going to talk about how to use um, built in functions. Um, so what a function is, is it does an operation and it usually takes some kind of value uh, or argument that gets passed into the function. So for example, length takes exactly one um, argument um, and it would have to be an array or a a string. Um, integer, string, or float built-in functions create new values from an existing um, variable and basically recast them. Um, print can take zero or more arguments. Um, and in fact, print uh, with no, uh, no argument will um, print a blank line. So I can write something like this print before, print, print, after, um, well, actually print 
an empty line in between. Um, so let's look at a couple of more built-in functions. Um, there's the max function and the min function. So max uh, finds the largest value um, out of multiple values and min the smallest. Um, and both work on character strings as well as numbers. Um, so if I type something like print max of one, two, three, um, unsurprisingly, it gets me the maximum of those three numbers. If I do the same thing with min, uh, one, two, three, it will give me one. What happens if I look at um, a mixture of strings? So if I look at print min, A, capital A, and zero, um, zero is the, the smallest. And this is, um, that basically it starts out with uh, numbers zero to nine, then capital letters A to Z, and then small letters A to Z. And that's how it will define and decide whether it's um, larger or smaller. Um, so functions may only work for uh, certain combinations of arguments. Um, I can look at something like print uh, max of one and a. Uh, it will complain about the fact that um, I'm basically giving it an integer and a string, and you can't um, compare between strings and integers and, and get a max value. So you'd have to cast that to um, a string as well in order to, to for this function to work. Um, the next function um, is the round function. Um, so round 3.712. Uh, well, round to four. What if I say round 3.712 and put up two after the comma, it will round to two decimal places. Um, probably one of the most useful um, built-in functions is help. Um, help actually gives you information on other functions. Um, so if I look at help round, um, it now prints um, something called a doc string. Um, and that will work on built-in functions as well as functions you have written yourself, yourself provided you have also written the um, documentation for it. So round takes in as input a number and then um, it takes a second arg argument and digits equals none. So by default, it doesn't expect that argument to be there, but if you do put it, it will then um, uh, return the number of decimal places based on what you say uh, in digits here. Um, so another way of accessing the help information, particularly in Jupyter Notebooks, um, yes, I would probably not cast um, int 3.721 in that way. And I'll probably try and get around. Well, it, depend, it depends what you want to do. Um, but I would, I would advise to use round. Um, because if you look at int, 3.71, you'll notice it'll round down and um, that would be the wrong rounding based on convention. Um, there's another one we're not gonna talk about called floor and ceiling um, that will um, 
round in either the upwards or, or, or downwards way. Um, so another way to look at um, the help is uh, in Jupyter Notebooks by using, so if you open your brackets and then hit shift tab, um, the same information as printed by the help function will pop up and you can, can read it. So, so what you do is you start typing a function and then you just inside the brackets go shift tab and uh, the help information pops up. Um, I think I mentioned this uh, briefly before. Again, Python is quite uh, good if it doesn't understand um, something. So, um, say I say name equals um, Lewis, and I hit enter. It will complain at the fact that I've not actually closed um, the the quotation mark here to indicate that Lewis is in fact a string, um, and it tells me, oh, there's a syntax error. EOL is end of line while scanning string literal. So it understands that this should be a string, but it's kind of looking for the, the closing bit of the string. So again, this might seem quite intimidating as a um, error message, but the more you run into these error messages, the clearer they, they get. Um, Another syntax error you could accidentally come across is something like age equals equals 52. Um, you're trying to assign a variable, but you accidentally double typed your, um, um, your equal sign. So it just tells you it's just invalid syntax. So it doesn't understand. Um, Then um, print let's see what other errors there are. Um, so uh, what I've forgotten here now is the closing parenthesis and it throws me a syntax error saying unexpected end of uh, function while passing. So again, usually the little arrow here indicates where the issue might be. So it's pointing at the double equal sign, it's pointing at the missing um, closed quotation marks and here at the missing uh, parenthesis, uh, parenthesis. So um, yeah, watch out for the little um, up arrow. arrow. Um, So another type of error are runtime errors. Let's um, add some more cells here again. So say um, age equals 53, um, remaining equals 100 minus age. Um, it basically complains that age isn't defined um, because I've misspelled it. And it will tell you which line the, the error happens. So it will use this nice sort of pointy error and find it line two and saying there's something wrong with it. So if you do run into an error, you will, um, look at, um, well, it usually tells you where the, the, the culprit line is, where things are going wrong. Uh, so, <clears throat> if, um, if we kind of go back to 
yeah, I, f I forgot. There's one more way of asking for help. So we have help, oops, help round one way. Then we can do round, uh, open, close bracket, shift tab, or we can do round question mark. And that will also, again, print the help. So there's basically three ways of querying what a function can do in Python. Um, <clears throat> then um, another thing is, so functions either take no arguments or take some arguments, but every function will return something. Um, if a function doesn't seem like it's returning anything, um, it will return a special value called none. So let's look at an example of that. Um, result equals print, hi, um, and then print um, result of print is result. Oh. Okay, uh, invalid syntax, what have I forgotten? I forgot to put a comma. Um, and now it tells me result of print is none. So this is um, a special identifier and basically that it, it doesn't uh, return an error or anything. Um, yeah, and this kind of gets us to the point where we can do some exercises on uh, the built-in functions. So I'm gonna share uh, again that bit of the um, lesson. So if you scroll down to, to the exercises part, there are four little exercises and we'll reconvene in five minutes or so. Um, if you're done with the exercises, just use your green um, sticker again so I, I know how you're getting on. Also, let me know if you have any questions at any point, obviously.
Right, I'm gonna carry on. Don't worry if you haven't completed all the exercise parts yet. Um, just a very brief recap. Um, so if you use hash, you can add comments to your um, programs and particularly explain um, difficult bits for future you or your co-workers. Um, then we talked about built-in functions, so they can take zero arguments or multiple arguments, depending on the type of function. If you want to look at the documentation of the function, you can either, either use the help function, the shift tab, or the um, name of the function plus the question mark. Um, we've encountered the min, max, and round function. Um, we also learned that every function returns something and you can query, like you can basically assign the return um, to a variable and then query what is in that variable. Um, and then we looked at various different errors you can encounter in, in Python. So now I'm gonna jump a little bit out of um, uh, order from, from the original uh, plan, just because I think the topic that is now about to start is quite um, ten intense. And I think it's probably better if we do that with a fresh head tomorrow morning. Um, so instead, we're going to start looking at um, how to work with lists and, and loops. Um, so yeah, the next topic is going to be lists. Um, so the idea behind a list is, so far we've learned how we can store one value in a variable. What about storing multiple variables? Um, and you can do that through um, using a list. And a list um, is contained contains many values um, within square brackets uh, and list entries are separated by commas. So you can say something like pressure, pressure equals 0 0.34 comma 0 0.277, 0 0.275 um, and 0 0.2 seven, eight. So now I have a list with four entries. Um, and I can, again, execute as before. And now I've assigned a list to this variable. Um, so the first thing we can look at is what is the type of pressure? You will see that it is now a list. You can look at uh, what is an contained in it, so print um, pressures, pressure. Um, you can also look at the length, um, again, using the len function, print um, length, len pressure. And it tells me it's length four. Um, I can also um, fetch items from uh, a list by using indexing. Again, just a reminder, we start indexing at zero in Python. So if I wanted the first element of my list, I can type something like print uh, pressure square bracket zero, and it will return my first entry, which is 0 0.34. I can also look at the last entry. So if we just count 0, 1, 2, 3. So if I wanted last entry, I can type 3. Or I can um, also count backwards. So another way of accessing the last entry is by using minus 1. Uh, and that also gives me the last entry. Um, you can uh, replace 
values within a list by uh, reassigning them. So at the moment, pressure zero has the value 0 0.34 associated to it. So we can say pressure um, zero is actually 0 0.37 because I actually made a um, notation error and I want to make sure that this gets updated. So if I now um, print pressure, you can see that the first entry got updated, uh, but all the other entries still remain the same. Uh, what you can also do is um, append to a list. Um, so let's define a new list um, of prime numbers um, and say the first prime numbers are two, three, and five. Um, and then say print uh, first three primes, what well, primes, and then um, I can append to that list uh, primes dot append and obviously the next prime number is seven and if I now look at what happens after the appending I can say um, uh, primes after appending primes. So First, we just assign our list primes, which has these three entries, two, three, five. And then the primes.append will add um, to the end of the list, the next prime number. Um, so if you want to, um, know what else can be done with lists, you can use help. Oops, list, not lists. Um, and you can see it has all these built in um, things. Um, so don't worry about the underscore underscore methods, we can just ignore those. Um, but you can see it has append, append object to the end of the list, which is what we just used, um, dot clear. So it's, it's always in the same sort of syntax. So you have the name of the list. So in this, car, in this case it was primes and then dot uh, name of the method and the name of the methods are these methods here. So dot clear would remove all the edges from the list. Um, copy returns a copy of the list, count, um, you can count the number of values uh, of a given, no, you count the number of occurrences of a given value um, and, and so forth. I mean, we're not gonna go through all of them, but basically there's a bunch of sort of useful inbuilt things you can probably look at um, in more detail in your own time. Um, so, the only thing that might be worthwhile looking at is actually the extends. Um, so that is very similar to append, but append basically just lets you add one item, whereas extends lets you add an entire new list, essentially. Um, so let's have a look at how that works. Um, so teen primes, equals, so that's 11, 13, 17, and 19. And then we have um, more primes equals um, 37, 41, 43, and 47. Um, <clears throat> And we still had primes from before. Um, primes, uh, so let's have another look at print primes. 
And now let's extend primes. Um, so primes dot extend teen primes. And let's print extended primes. And then um, what if we try to append primes with the more primes? And last primes, primes. Let's uh, see what happens when we execute this. So you are, what you can see is with the extending of primes, it basically appends to the same list and just adds these onto that list. Whereas the append bit actually, if you now look at the last entry of primes, so if we look at the last entry of primes, oops, um, it is actually a list in itself. It's not a single number because it's now this this list so um it kind of really depends on what you want to do with uh your data or with your lists <coughs> um so i guess i wasn't super happy with actually um adding the list at the end so let's delete that um, and we can um, use the del functionality. So del primes of minus one. Um, if I now look at primes again, it has gotten rid of uh, my accidentally appended list, which is something we don't want. Um, <clears throat> You can create um, a list that is empty. Um, empty list equals, and you use simply um, two square brackets, one open and one closed one. That that um, um, yeah is defining the list, and you can then add things to it. <clears throat> Um, lists can also um, contain different types. Uh, so let's say goals equals one. Create list two. Extract item from list um, three. Oh, I missed a comma there. Modify list. So if I now look at goals. Um, you can see all the entries and it's a mixture of strings and um, integers. So from before we've learned that uh, character strings can be indexed like lists. Um, so we'd looked at um, the atom name helium so let's um, <clears throat> look at a similar example again. Element equals carbon. Um, and I can look at my zeroth element is element zero should give me the letter C. And it does. Um, so what we've seen above from the list is that we could do something like um, element zero equals C because say, oh, I actually want 
my carbon to be capitalized. So I want to replace my first character. <clears throat> but it says string object does not support item assignment. Uh, what does that mean? It means that a string object um, has a property called immutable, which means it cannot be changed after creation, whereas a list um, is mutable and can be modified in place. So you can adjust each item in the list after you've created it. Um, so Python considers the string uh, to be single values with parts, not a collection of values, which kind of makes sense. Um, so what happens if you were to accidentally index beyond um, what is defined? So let's go with something like the um, 99th element of element is um, 99. Um, it'll give you an error message saying that your string index is out of range. Um, that will be very similar for your prime. So print um, 99th element of primes is uh, primes 99 and it will also tell you that the list index is out of range um, so you can and if you're unsure how many indices they are uh, how many elements there are in a list or in a string you can always use the length functionality to query that and that way you shouldn't you can avoid these um, index out of range um, errors so um, yeah, I would like you to now have a look at the exercises associated with lists. Um, so if you scroll to the bottom of the page I just shared in the chat, um, there are a bunch of exercises around lists. Um, and yeah, let's give it 10 minutes for you to, to have a look at those.
Is everyone doing okay or do you have any questions with regard to Luke? Not lists, sorry, not loops. Never mind. I have already ahead. All right, we probably haven't finished all the exercises, but I will um, take the last 12 minutes of today to um, introduce one last concept uh, so that we have plenty of time for tomorrow to do um, other things. And this kind of ties quite well into lists. Uh, so just a quick recap. So lists store many single values. Uh, these values can have different types. Um, you can replace items within a list um, because they're mutable, whereas you can't do that with strings. You can add things to a list by using the append or the extend um, methods. You can uh, delete uh, entries from a list by using the del functionality. Um, and yeah, if you try and access elements in a list that don't exist, obviously Python is going to complain. Um, so what about wanting to access many things in a list? So I have my primes still. Uh, let's have a look at, at primes, what's in there. Uh, what if I now want to print all the elements of prime? So an obvious way to do that would be by saying print primes zero. And normally I wouldn't use copy and paste, but because I'm trying to show a point here, I will use copy and paste. Um, so I'm just going to print a bunch of times, so I now need to print primes one, primes two, primes three, primes four. Um, okay, I need some more. Okay, four, five, six, and the last entry as well. Okay, so you can see this is already getting kind of annoying, and I had to copy paste, I needed to change this indexing variable. And um, I'm very likely to probably make an error with, with this um, way of trying to access all the elements. 
So instead, uh, what we can use to do that is something called loops. Um, and that is a very useful tool in Python and pretty much every programming language. So rather than printing um, all the elements with a new line by using this syntax, I can, I can use a so-called for loop. And the for loop um, syntax looks like this. So I say for uh, number, well actually for, yeah, for number in primes print number. And that will in fact print exactly the same thing as above, but I only needed to write two lines and didn't need to copy and paste anything. Um, so the for loop is made up of a collection, a loop variable uh, and a body. So the collection in this case is my list primes. Um, I could also write something like this for number in one, two, three, four, five, six. So I don't have to have had defined a list beforehand um, in order to, to be successful here. So that is my collection. So that could be a list, that could be a different type of collection, um, or you could just write it out like this. Um, you then have a body, which in this case is the print statement. And you notice how there's a colon here. And then when you jump to the next line, there are these four empty um, spaces. So you indent to indicate that this is part of my loop um, and that creates the, the loop body. And then the last thing is the loop variable, which is the current thing. So basically as I step through that list, that list of primes, number get assigned to whatever variable I'm stepping in through, or in this case, I get, it gets assigned to one, then two, then three, and so forth. So, okay, print number, it helps if I don't make a typo. Um, it, it basically walks my way through through this collection, this loop variable. Um, so if I try to um, get rid of this indentation here, I'll in fact get an error and it tells me I am expected an indentation block because I've put a colon here um, and therefore the language is clever enough to realize that there, there's, a, there's a problem. Um, <clears throat> so you may might have heard of other programming languages that use brackets and things, curly brackets, uh, begin and um, Python solely relies on indentation. Um, <clears throat> so this kind of indentation problem you can also encounter if you accidentally do something like um, this first name equals John, and then say you do something like that, uh, last name equals Wilson. Um, it will also complain um, at an unexpected indent um, because this should be the same code block. Um, all right, let's go back to um, our loop. So the loop variable can be called anything. So in this case, um, using the word number made sense because we're looping over numbers, uh, but I could have written the same thing um, and called it kitten um, in two, three, four, um, print, kitten. Um, in this case, kitten doesn't make so much sense, but um, if I say cats equals uh, Molly, Fluffy, and Scratchy, then using kittens uh, makes more sense. So if I now uh, replace the um, 
the collection I'm looping over, say for kitten and cats, um, I'm now looping over this list of cat names. Um, <clears throat> in fact, you can have in your body of your loop, you, you don't have to have just a single statement that is a print statement, you can do many things. Um, so if we, I'm just gonna, um, for number and price, um, I'm gonna look at the square equals, um, actually, I'm gonna use the loop variable p square p to the power of, p to the power of two uh, cubed equals p to the power oh, to the power of three and then print p which is my current entry of primes um, squared cubed Square, not squared. Let's call it squared and actually spell it correctly. Um, it will walk through my primes list and then square my prime and cube my prime and then do that for the next one and the next one and the next one. <clears throat> you can use um, range to create a range of numbers without having to write out one, two, three, four, five. Um, that will look um, this way. So this is again another built-in function. Um, print a range is not a list. Um, range zero three. Um, ah, sorry, but we can use that in for loop for number in range zero three print number um, yeah it will just print zero one and two uh, so it doesn't include uh, your last index like any of the indexing um, as before and so the last useful thing um, about loops really is uh, something called the accumulator pattern um, that can turn many values into one. So say you wanted to um, count, you, you wanted to have a counter or you wanted to sum over all the values in your list. So um, let's look at summing up <clears throat> um, the first 10 integers. Uh, so we have a running total. Um, that starts at, starts at zero. And then for number in range 10. So range 10 goes from zero to um, 10, nine, in fact, um, number. Uh, let's start with printing what the current number is. And then we can say total equals the same as total from the previous step uh, plus number plus one. And then um, after my for loop, I can print. Let's uh, actually spell this correctly total. Uh, I can look at my cumulative. Um, some. So here is how what the print does is just go from zero to nine um, as I'm walking through my loop. Uh, and then this value total is accumulated. So if I start printing total beforehand, and then I can say print number and total, you can see how how that grows uh, with each step of the iteration. Um, for the looping, there's also a bunch of exercises. I will encourage you to do these, um, well, tonight, basically before we start up again tomorrow morning, 
uh, and I'm happy to take some questions if they arise um, tomorrow about um, any of the looping exercises or in fact any of the Python we've covered today. Uh, but in the interest of actually finishing um, on time, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at this now and we will reconvene at nine o'clock tomorrow, is that correct? Yeah, okay. So nine o'clock, yes. Yeah. So if you have any questions with regard to the uh, loops exercise uh, from what I've just gone through now, uh, maybe if you can connect five, 10 minutes early, I'll be there from probably about 10 to nine tomorrow morning um, and I can help with any questions on any of the material we cover this afternoon. And then tomorrow we're going to look at um, pandas and plotting and um, many more exciting Python things. Um, thank you so much for joining me for this afternoon and I look forward to seeing everyone again tomorrow. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Tony, and excellent timekeeping. So I don't want to hold anyone any longer. If you have any questions now, uh, please feel free to ask ask them. And as you can see, we've done loops in, in, in Shell this morning and we've done loops in the programming language Python now. You can see how loops are a very useful construct that it's just um, present in, in any programming language um, that you will come across. So just before you go, um, I'll quickly share my screen. If you head over to... Um, to Etherpad on line, just below line 440. And if you can leave some feedback for us on the afternoon session. So um, what went well? What did you learn that you're excited about using in your work or things that uh, were perhaps um, not clear or um, something that needs more explanation. So just leave some feedback for us and, and then feel free to, uh, to disconnect. We have the same Zoom URL and the same password for tomorrow. And we are going to stay around if you want to, to discuss anything with us over the next 